Hello Year 10, it's uh, Mr Brennan here and uh, I hope that this piece of work this week finds you well. Uh, I will say that I hope everybody's safe uh, and taking good care of themselves in these difficult times. I've spoken to uh, Mr Voice and Mr Hales and some of the quality of the work that we've had in is exceptional so far and you're making a really, really good job of keeping up and trying to learn some really new geography in a time which is not ideal and we do know that so hopefully by doing a few videos talking over them and at some point maybe if I get a haircut we can uh, make it so that you can see my face I'll put a video on it this might help you along a little bit what I thought I'd do is just very quickly talk you through some of the work on development that you've already done and for the majority of you this will be in the booklet that you've been working through and you might want to just quickly, as we go through the video, pause it in places, see if you've got the right idea, if there's anything that you can add. We started off then by looking at what development was. Um, and we're pretty good with this. We've all the way through geography, we look at hicks and licks and knees, and we know what that means. And we know that the quality of life is affected by whether you live in a hick or a lick. And some of the reasons why different countries have got different levels of development. You did look at this map and it was a nice to describe the distribution of. So you're looking for trends, um, evidence and anomaly. But at the time, I also asked you to, as an extension, to think about how it differed from the north-south divide. You'll notice that there are very few low-income countries in the world now. And the majority of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. It's the poorest continent on the planet. Most other countries around the world are either knees or hicks. But you can still see that there's a little bit of a pattern there. Countries generally in the Northern Hemisphere are more developed than those in the Southern. Australia and New Zealand are clearly exceptions to the rule. We need to have evidence to work out why this is the case. We can't just say they've got bigger cars, nicer buildings, things like that. We need proof. So on this table that you've got, there are development indicators, the evidence we need. Things like life expectancy, it tells you about healthcare. Things like your GDP, how much money you make. The amount of pupils that go to primary schools, it tells you about education and the skills that they'll have and the type of jobs that they can get growing up. Population growth tells you about how birth rate and death rate might be affected. So all these things tell you all about the level of development in a country. And you did some work looking at various different development indicators. Some of them you'd seen in year seven when we played top trumps. You looked at some very obvious ones like GNI or GDP, how much money a country earns. And then uh, we looked at the HDI. And I just want to spend a second talking about the HDI. The HDI is something called a composite development indicator. It is the best development indicator of them all. And the reason for that is that a composite indicator takes into account more than one factor. So you will see it takes into account social and economic factors, life expectancy, education, and then economically the GNI or GDP per head. It's measured between 0 to 1 and where it is 1, it means it's the best level of development and where it is lower, 0, it, it means it's the worst. The one thing it doesn't take into account is environmental factors, and that's a little bit of a criticism of the HDI. But generally, if we were to pick one development indicator, that would be the one that we would use. You then looked at something called the demographic transition model, and I was really impressed with the work that you did on this. All this is, is a model that shows that how population changes as a country develops. So if you're in stage one, you can see that birth rate and death rate are really high. That means that these countries are licks. These are licks uh, and the poorest licks in the world, places like Chad, where there's very little contraception, there's very little health care. So the birth rate is high, but equally people die younger. You'll see as you move through the demographic transition model that initially the death rate drops. This is some of the licks in the world, but where they've got some sort of healthcare going on, some clinics, some uh, access to vaccines and things like that. In stage three, you, beget, you become knees. 
uh, birth rate drops a little and uh, starts to get close to that death rate. And this is because in these people start to have less children because that culture of having children and the need to have children uh, is reduced. Stage four is where the UK is. Uh, birth rates only slightly above death rate. Population is still going up. Stage five is a few countries in the world, Japan and Italy. They're both in this stage. And it's where for the first time the birth rate drops below the death rate. Therefore, the population starts to decrease. And this is because of a number of reasons. Uh, the lack of children are expensive, so people have less children. Um, women have careers, so they have children later. Therefore, they have fewer children. Um, and less emphasis is placed on the need to have bigger families. And hopefully you've annotated around this. If you haven't at this point, go back to it, have a look, see how you can work out that stage one is the poorest licks in the world. Stage two are licks. Stage three are your knees, China's, India's, Brazil's. Stage four are hicks like the UK. Stage five, some, of, some countries in the world, very few. You see it's in a dotted line, that means it wasn't there originally. You then looked at what are the factors that influence development and we broke them down into physical, economic and historical. And then you looked at a range of information over the next couple of slides. And you had to think about which factors were which. I will briefly summarise this. If we think that Africa is the poorest continent in the world with the countries that are still in stage one of the demographic transition model with a really low HDI, with high birth rates and high death rates and low life expectancy and lack of investment. We can summarize all of that from those slides. Possibly the most important physical factor would be the lack of access to um, the climate that's necessary to develop. Hot, dry climates do not lead to great development. Economically, who's going to invest in Africa? Very few TNCs are going to invest in sub-Saharan Africa. And equally, for the countries right in the middle of the continent, they're what we call landlocked. They don't have access to a coast. If they don't have access to a coast, then the problem they have is they can't trade. If you can't trade, you can't develop the economy. You can't get the positive multiplier effect growing. Historically, it's always interesting, and I always talk about uh, colonization. Lots of African countries were once colonized or owned by European countries. So Britain owned certain countries in Africa and um, France and Belgium. This meant that historically, all of those countries' natural resources were taken by Britain, France and Belgium. And while they grew and they developed, the countries were left behind. They may now have got their independence back and may not be controlled by another country, but their resources are already gone. No resources means no development. You then went on to start looking at what were the different strategies used to narrow the development gap. And you looked at a range of different ideas. And I won't spend too long on these, but you can go back and all the information you need is there. What I will say is in the exam, there are some questions that will come up will always be a maximum of three marks. So investment will always be a maximum of three marks. The key thing around investment is to understand the multiplier effect. We have spoken about it before and we will speak about it again. But the multiplier effect is how you make the economy grow. It means that if you get people buying things in your country, then the businesses that start to grow, they can spend the money on something else. And if you remember in class, I may have used the example of the pound and how if you spend a pound in your local community, it means that shopkeeper can go spend that pound somewhere else, maybe a florist. And that florist can then go spend that pound somewhere else. Maybe they feel luxury, a, a nice meal maybe, or maybe they'll go to the pub that night and they'll have a beer and then they can spend the pub keeper, they can spend that pound back in the community. It's the same pound coin going round, but it helps the economy grow. That's the positive multiplier effect. And this is really important to understand when we think about investment. Again, this shows that kind of idea. Aid 
there were different types of aid and I hope that you've uh, managed to summarize them and aid is one way that we can give money to certain countries uh, through either governments or NGOs and hope help their development fair trade most of you should know this uh, I bet everybody today has had something that is fair trade um, whether it be their bananas or their coffees or their teas or their chocolate um, and it's important because it protects the poorest countries in the world microfinance and that lovely example of uh, phones for women in Bangladesh is where you give a small loan and hopefully uh, people are able to sort of develop a small business so $200 here then the mobile phone could be used uh, to check prices at markets and make sure that their businesses could start to grow intermediate technologies these are really small scales uh, we'll look at these again at other points um, but things like hand pumps um, cheap solar uh, powered LED light bulbs all the things that we probably take for real granted but just help uh, the poorest countries in the world to develop these are really good for little local projects debt relief uh, is about trying to uh, make sure that countries that are in debt to Hicks so Licks that owe Hicks money because of loans and previous types of aid maybe we can cancel some of that debt maybe we can uh, reduce the interest on it because some countries get themselves into the position where all they can afford to ever pay off is the interest. They're not paying that loan back. Therefore, they stay permanently poor. There are two types of strategies that will or could be a nine mark question in your exam. You started looking at TNCs, a transnational corporation. We will look at another TNC when we do our work on Nigeria. And we'll look at how a TNCs help Nigeria's economic growth. However, I asked you this time to look at how Coca-Cola might be able to uh, support the development of countries. And we did look at Coca-Cola in India. Very controversial, very, very um, split in terms of whether it was positive or negative. Things like using up really, really necessary water that farmers and, uh, and local uh, people need to make their Coke. However, it did bring some benefits. And we saw that Coca-Cola was a TNC, and these were the kind of reasons why. A company that's got its headquarters in one country, but it's manufacturing its production all over the world, particularly in uh, Licks and Knees. And if you think about other TNCs like Nike, if you check your clothes, your Nike trainers, where do they come from? I guarantee they'll be made in a Lick or a Knee. Um, you then categorized all of these statements. You don't need to use all of them, um, but it did give, give you some positives and it did give you some negatives, which is exactly what we need for a nine mark question. Remember, R2D2 says one, two, three, two. So, you know, you could say it's positive because Coke invests one billion in India. That, that means that they can invest in India. That's the positive multiplier effect, isn't it? They can start to grow that economy. However, However, it's been reported that some workers work 12-hour shifts for 50 cents. Is it really helping those people? So there's lots of information there. And you could do that nine mark question simply based on Coca-Cola. We won't do because I didn't ask you to do that question. I asked you to do a um, paragraph, an R2-D2 paragraph, and a summary about whether you thought Coca-Cola had been uh, useful in narrowing the development gap. Take a couple of minutes at this point, pause the video, go back to your booklet, have a think about the things I've just talked about and see if you can um, consider how you've worked, if there's any gaps that you might want to fill and do you understand all the things that are uh, running through this topic. Okay, welcome back. And um, we'll get on to today's or this week's work. What I will say is this is just the final objective in the booklet. Um, and what I would like you to be thinking about is how we commit this knowledge to our long term memory. That doesn't stop because we're not in school. Um, it doesn't become less important. In fact, it probably becomes more important. So what I'm going to encourage you to do 
um, this week is finish off this key objective. The following week, all the work will be around producing revision resources, mind maps, flashcards, any way you want to revise, all based around this booklet. So you might want to start thinking about that in advance. The final way we're going to look at how the development gap can be closed is to look at a case study of Jamaica. It's about how we can effectively use tourism. Is it positive? Is it negative? This, along with the TNCs, is one that could be a nine mark question. And you will see that you are going to put together a nine mark question for this. So in your booklet, there are a variety of sections for you to fill in all around tourism in Jamaica. You need to work uh, on your sheet and fill it in. Normally we'd do this in teams, but ultimately we, we are working at home in a different circumstance. Keep in mind as you complete all of the work, is tourism an effective strategy to narrow the development gap? Is it sustainable? Does it work for everybody? Does it help everybody that's involved in tourism? The resources over the next couple of slides are a map of Jamaica, which shows you the physical and human geography. So it shows you where the towns are and it shows you the rivers and the lakes and the hills and, 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 and so on. Gives you some population data and information about Jamaica's economy. What evidence is there that Jamaica is a lick? How do we know? Go back to those development indicators. It shows you a map showing variations in GDP in Jamaica. Is development equal in all places? And remember, this is really, really important for a country to really develop and for a strategy to be successful. It has to benefit everybody, but particularly the poorest people. There's no point in the richer get, richest getting richer if the poorer are left behind. And then there's some information about tourism in Jamaica, including speech bubbles. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of tourism for Jamaica as it tries to develop? What I'll do is I'll move the slides on and wait for 30 seconds. And what you can do is you can pause the video and you can take the information you need from each bit. So... Here's your first slide, an introduction to Jamaica. Pause the video. Okay, welcome back. And hopefully you've finished that first section. Here's some selected population data. So how I think about what this shows us. Birth rates really high, death rates starting to get lower. Which level of the demographic transition model is that? Important that about 70% of all university graduates, they uh, they leave the country. Life expectancy, that's actually been going down. What can you deduce from that table? Pause the video. Fill it in. Welcome back again. Some information here about the economy of Jamaica. Um, have a read through. Anything stand out to you? You can see that Jamaica was part of the British Empire. It was colonised. I've spoken about that earlier in this video. Until 1962. Some wealthy people. Most Jamaicans now work in the tertiary sector. Remember the tertiary sector is about providing services. The graph at the bottom is interesting, shows how the economy of Jamaica is growing. But think about that in comparison to similarish level of development countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Pause the video. What information can you use? Okay. Remember, development needs to be equal. Map here showing variations of GDP per person, how much money per person they earn. Possibly, you could link this map back to the original map. Where are the main towns? Is there a pattern to do with urban areas and rural areas? I can tell you there is. Pause the video. Welcome back. Nice image here of an all-inclusive holiday resort on the north coast of Jamaica. I'm sure at the moment all of us would love to have the opportunity to go somewhere like that, but 
for the time being. I think we're all stuck in our houses. So interesting to note here and something worth picking up. That's an all-inclusive holiday resort. That means people will stay in that holiday resort on the whole. Is that good for the development of the island? Is that going to boost the positive multiplier effect in the local towns and villages? Also for that holiday resort, I guarantee it's owned by a TNC, a transnational corporation. Therefore, where are all the profits going? Pause the video. Consider your thoughts. Back again. A bit more information. I'm not going to talk you through this one. I'm going to let you uh, see what you can work out. It's linked to that image previously. Pause the video. Welcome back again. Uh, here's a rural community. So that difference between urban and rural looks very different to the holiday accommodation that was um, shown in the previous image. Again, sometimes in geography, a picture paints a thousand words. We've seen places like this before in Brazil, in Rio. Okay, final task then. You should have completed most of that in the booklet. What I want you to do is have a go at this nine mark question. Evaluate, so straight away we think R2D2. For those of us going for those grades five to nine, we think R2D2. Two, 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 two. It's got a stutter, remember, and that's called a double development. Furthermore, building on this, additionally, all those connectives we can use. This exam question is a nice one. Evaluate the effectiveness of tourism in reducing the development gap. Use figure nine and your own knowledge. So your first R2D2 paragraph has to use figure nine. We've not done Botswana. You don't need to. It's all the information is there for you. All the information to get up to a cracking start. Your second and third paragraphs should be about Jamaica. You've got all the information you've just collected. And what I want to see when you submit this is I want to see two more on top of the first paragraph, two more R22, D22 paragraphs. I don't want it to go further than that. I don't want uh, 350 words. I want you to do it so that you get those nine marks. When you've submitted this, when we give feedback, I will produce a model answer, which uh, I hope has been being useful for you. And you can consider uh, your mark against that model answer. So your teacher will provide you with a mark out of nine and the model answer for you to have a look at whether you could improve yours further. If you want to have a bit of a go at self-assessing it though, feel free to share it with people at home or um, have a go at marking it yourself. Let us know what you think you've got and that would be great. And that will be the final topic in this section on development. So well done on completing that booklet. Do get it uploaded to us. As I said earlier, next week's work will be about committing this to your long-term memory um, before we move on to any new content. I'm really keen to make sure that what we're doing now stays firmly in our minds. So work hard this week. I hope the video has been useful, particularly the bits that have recapped initially. Um, and hopefully you've produced a really nice piece of work there um, based around how tourism can or cannot reduce the development gap. So until next time, take care, stay safe, work hard, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Bye-bye.